next talk is the untold story of Edward Snowden's escape from Hong Kong and how you can help the refugee, uh, refugees who saved his life. And we have three speakers today uh, at this talk. Lena Rohrbach is for Amnesty International Germany's expert on human rights in the digital age and a moral philosopher by training. Then we have Sönke Iversen, Uh, he's head of the investigative uh, research unit at Handelsblatt, his specialty uncovering corruption, fraud and gross mismanagement. And finally, Robert Thibault, he is a human rights lawyer in Hong Kong and incidentally one of Edward Snowden's lawyers and is still in contact with him today. And uh, this is your stage and please give a warm round of applause to all three of those. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. Very good. Uh, as you've just been told, my name is Lena, and I work for Amnesty International in Germany, where I cover human rights in the digital age. We're still figuring out what exactly that means. But it includes issues of freedom of speech and information online and the human right to privacy, which is being um, undermined by mass and targeted surveillance and lots of other human rights, rights which are threatened or strengthened by the increasing use of ICT. Usually it's both at the same time. At Amnesty, we are also part of the campaign to pardon Snowden, which I'm going to tell you about today. Tonight you're first going to hear about Snowden and his current situation in Russia, and then about his escape from Hong Kong and how to help the refugees who saved him. And I'm really happy to see many people here interested in this talk because I think there's a fascinating story to be told later, unfortunately not my part of the talk, but theirs. And I believe it is an important story to tell, especially in these times, with the ongoing debate on refugees and asylum, where refugees are often portrayed as an anonymous mass, more the object of political decisions than actors of change, which themselves, of course, they also are. But before we come to that, Let's start with the Snowden situation first. As you all know, Snowden shared US intelligence documents with journalists in summer 2016 in Hong Kong, which revealed the shocking extent of global mass surveillance. Snowden claimed that the sole motive for this was, and I quote his own words, to inform the public as to that which is done in their name and that which is done against them. But the US government branded him a traitor who, as they say, has significantly harmed US national security interests. So here's his current situation. After fleeing Hong Kong, he was stuck in transit at the Moscow airport until he was granted a temporary right to remain in Russia. US authorities, US authorities revoked his passport, which interferes with his ability to travel to other countries and to apply for asylum in a country of his choosing. There have been several offers, among them Venezuela, Bolivia, and Nicaragua. He has been granted residency in Russia until August 2017. After that, it could be extended or not. There's no way to know yet. So why doesn't he just return to the US? At least President Obama seems to think that this is what he should do. Sorry. This is not good. Here we go. Okay, so we don't have phone and electricity. I'm very sorry about that. Can someone help me with that? I was going to show you a video. And I believe that for environmental reasons, you shouldn't give up on your old computers too early. So I'm still using my eight year old MacBook and its battery is broken because as you all know, they have a problem with the batteries. Okay.
Fall das jetzt? Ich weiß auch nicht, ich mal. Es ist Short Intermission. Nice, isn't it? Oh, yeah. Very good. Thanks for giving me such a great cue. <laughs> why, why, why stop now? Das brauchst du jetzt leider im Moment, weil er das komplett neu hochfahren muss und er ist halt einfach total alt. Um, so the uh, computer is okay, rebooting now. I'm sorry, the, the computer is whistling. rebooting. As yeah. I said, it's a pretty old one. There's something you can do while I'm waiting for it to reboot, besides singing, which is great and really good. Um, there are pens and papers next to the microphones one to six, and you can just hand them out. If you're sitting next to it, just share them with others around you. So everyone has a pen and a paper. No, it's just one paper. I see the spreading is commencing. That is nice. Who? Uh, I hope you all uh, all are familiar with the six to one rule. Yes. Yes. Some. No. No. Six hours of sleep, two meals, and one shower. <laughs> Not every day. Every day. Huh? Of all three days. Who? Who try? Who followed that? Hands in the air, please. And everybody who did not follow that knows how, why he's not or she is not raising their hands, right? Some people joked about this, oh, six showers a day, that is quite a lot. One meal and only two hours of sleep, I'm exhausted already. Oh, there's, there's lights flashing. And uh, uh, I hope now this is going well. We'll take a few more minutes. Okay. You're doing a great job. Oh, thanks. He's yeah, doing a thanks. really great job entertaining oh, oh, you. Thank come you very on. much. <laughs> and you're doing a great Thank job you. singing. That is actually quite nice when, when such thing is happening. I like your... So this is a picture I took in South Africa at a memorial for apartheid and the fight against apartheid. I thought it was a pretty one. South Africa, definitely. That was my first thought also. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I don't want to make uh, uh, fun of your really, yeah, really... That's, that's that's really, you're okay. doing a great yes. job. Sorry, guys. No, uh, there's no stress. I think we have... Uh, no, we, we will keep a, keep a tight schedule. I know when I make loose comments about the, uh, this is the last talk and then there's a big break, I will be slaughtered afterwards, or at least beaten into a dark corner or something, or drowned in chunk or something. <laughs> Which would not be that bad, actually. <laughs> not drowning, <laughs> but, well, the, I could show resistance at the first, well, don't go there, I think, right? Um, so, uh, another thing is, uh, I think we have uh, not only those three uh, around here, so far I can give you hints, who's also maybe attending the thing. Some of you maybe have recognized uh, that there's a little bit more going on at this corner where we have set up all the uh, technical stuff and that there's uh, some uh, new equipment arrived from another room, but that is enough hints, I think, for the most of you. I'm hypnotized by these pieces of wood, or is it actually rock? Another joke? Oh well, uh, so uh, when somebody is uh, able to articulate, then you have much, uh, way too much uh, processing power in your brain left. So let's do a teaser. So everybody silently in your head, think of a number between one and 10. Not telling that the other, uh, the other guy silently. And then multiply it by nine, please. And when you have the result, add up the single digits. So the 
When you have 23, you add 2 pl uh, plus 3 is 5, like that, okay? Then you divide 5, you got that? Okay, when, when you, uh, no, not divide 5, uh, subtract 5, I'm sorry. Subtract 5, not divide by 5, subtract, subtract 5, I'm sorry. And now you count through the alphabet. When you have a 1, you take A, 2B, 3C, 4D, 5E, and so on and so forth. And now, this letter you have with your result, in your head, silently search for a country starting with that letter, which has a border with Germany and a fruit. Denmark and Dutch, uh, Denmark and dates, or Dutch and dragon fruit? No? Maybe I give away the secret about this. I think Obama wants to talk. Yes? Yeah, unfortunately, he doesn't want to talk. He just wants to look a little grumpy. And I think that's because he knows that what he's going to say is not going to resonate well with you. For good reasons. I'm sorry. Uh. We had this copy wrongs 2.0 just about two hours ago in this in this hall. Maybe you w want to give a summarize of what he's saying. Yeah, probably. When we can't switch. pursue him to speak up or on. Yeah, the problem is that I have more videos on here. So I'm I'm terribly sorry about that. If I had a worst case scenario, how this would go, it would be my computer without electricity for a few seconds. And I guess we should just change, and I'll do my part later, and you do your parts first. I'm so sorry about that. Okay. Okay, that works. Sorry. No, it's a good ending. Uh, Young. The thing to switch. The, no, the... The trigger on the, on the to flip. Yeah. Yeah. Is this at all? No, it's your one. Hm. Das ist das Problem. Brauchst du noch ein. Ähm, Fängt nicht, fäng nicht an. Ja, wenn Sie nicht sagen, mhm. drücke ich gerne ein. Ah, jetzt geht's. Ah, okay. Good evening. Uh, thank you for coming. My name is Sönke Iversen and I'm an investigative journalist at Handelsblatt, which is. Uh, for those who are not from here. I'm from here, I was born in Hamburg, spent most of my life here, and then I uh, went out into the world. Now my, I'm at Handelsblatt, which is like the German Financial Times, Wall Street Journal. And um, since 2012, we, uh, we founded at Handelsblatt an investigative research unit, which uh, is like the spotlight team of Germany, of my paper at least. And so we, we cover mismanagement, fraud, corruption. Uh, sometimes we, when we do well, people go to jail. And about a year ago, I came across uh, the story of Edward Snowden that nobody had heard before. And I was surprised because I thought, Edward Snowden, everything's told. Um, the whole world media has covered it, but actually there was a big part uh, missing. And I would like to uh, tell you today about that part and about the people who saved Edward Snowden's life and for, who have for three years remained completely silent on that. Many people have taken credit in the 
Snowden story. I will not name any names now. Um, but those who actually saved his life when he came out and told the world about the mass surveillance, they have remained silent and um, they're in big trouble. So most of you, I, I assume, have seen this movie, Citizen Four. It's a very good movie. And again, you would assume that uh, the documentary about Snowden, how Snowden became who he was and, and <clears throat> told the world about this, would also tell everything there is to know about him. But again, there's a scene missing. There's something very big missing. Actually, two weeks are missing. If you remember, there's a scene right after the morning after he, he gave his interview with The Guardian. You see him in his hotel room, room uh, 1014. And he's kind of walking around. There's a scene, he's looking in the mirror, thinking of how can I reshape my face or my, my, uh, dye my hair, or cut my hair, I put on sunglasses. He's holding a mirror at one point, uh, an, an umbrella. And then the phone rings and he's talking to somebody and he's saying, okay, all right, are you sure? Because I can grab my stuff and I can just get out. And you don't hear the other side of the conversation. But actually the man on the other side of that telephone is here today. We will very soon hear from him. And then you see him hanging up the phone and he's just standing there. And you, you see him saying, and you, you, I, I thought to myself, why is he just standing there? This man is now sought after. The police is chasing him. The NSA is chasing him. The CIA. Everybody's chasing him. My colleagues, hundreds of journalists at that time, flooding into, the, into Kowloon in Hong Kong to search for Edward Snowden. And he's just standing there, not moving. And then the next thing you see is the door opens, he's getting out of the hotel. And the next scene in Citizen Four is actually two weeks later. Citizen Four does not show where Edward Snowden hid in Hong Kong for two weeks before he uh, boarded that Aeroflot uh, airplane to Moscow, where he still is today. So how did he do that? And uh, I would like to welcome now to the stage the man who hid Edward Snowden for two weeks when the whole world was <laughs> chasing him. So um, obviously the most, uh, the easiest question for me is, where were you on that Monday morning, June 10th, 2013, when Edward Snowden became the most wanted man alive? Well, that was, that was on June the 10th, and for a period of time, as everyone knows, uh, there was an unknown uh, employee of the US government who was leaking information about the US government's spying. It was about 6 a.m. and my phone rang. And I was tired, Monday morning. And I answered the phone, on the other side of the phone was a request for help. And it was explained to me it was Mr. Snowden and that he had a video of him in an interview with The Guardian, Glenn Greenwald had been televised. So at that point, I jumped out of bed showered, put my suit on, grabbed my briefcase, and got in my car and drove to the ferry pier. I live on an outer island, and that was the fastest way to get to Hong Kong Island on a high-speed ferry. So you can see Lantau Island, and there's a high-speed ferry that goes across to Hong Kong Island. So time was of the essence. Um, 
As a lawyer, the approach I took was there was a man who was in immediate distress, and I also understood that he was the most wanted man on the planet at that point. So it was crucial that I had access to him as soon as possible. Yeah, so my job is very easy. How do you hide the most wanted man alive? Where do you hide it? What, what was going through your mind at that time? The, the first thing I needed to do was gain access to, to Ed. And in Hong Kong, I had a solicitor with me. Um, so the first thing we had to do is, a, is because what he had done, in my view, was a, an act of political opinion expression. So we had to get him to the UNHCR office in Hong Kong immediately so he could raise his asylum claim. And this was the first line of defense. Um, if Mr. Snowden was arrested at any time, it was his refugee claim that would protect him from being removed from Hong Kong. We did that. Uh, we walked him into the UNHCR. So in the film Citizen Four, you see my colleague, uh, Jonathan Mann, a solicitor, and I'm on the phone with Mr. Snowden, basically, and I told him, don't worry, Jonathan Mann knows where to take you, and we're going to the UNHCR. So once we were, Mr. Snowden raised his claim at the UNHCR for <coughs> refugee status determination, then the next step was we had to bring Mr. Snowden underground, put him underground, and take him off the radar. And we were concerned that the media would find Mr. Snowden, and if the media found Mr. Snowden, then the Hong Kong authorities would find Mr. Snowden. There's a US consulate in Hong Kong. They would know where he was. So one of our biggest fears was the US government or a third government would grab Mr. Snowden and unlawfully rendition him. Mr. Snowden would disappear. The approach I took was Mr. Snowden was a, an asylum seeker at that point, a refugee. And I have many, many clients who are refugees. So it just made sense to place him within the refugee community. He was part of that community. The second reason is Hong Kong asylum seekers are so marginalized. They're considered it's Hong Kong's version of untouchables. They're the most reviled social group in Hong Kong. So to place Mr. Snowden, a man of his intelligence, status, his experience with the US government, and to place him in with the refugee community in Hong Kong, mainly people from South Asia or Southeast Asia, this would be the last place the world would look. So immediately after the UNHCR, I, I took, we took Mr. Snowden to stay with one of three refugee families. The second crucial reason aspect of this is we wanted, I wanted Mr. Snowden to be placed in the middle of the city. No one would expect Mr. Snowden to be hidden in plain sight. And the third reason was we wanted Mr. Snowden to have access to wireless communications where he could crack into any modem within the area. So we placed him with a group of asylum seekers, three families, and through that process, Mr. Snowden was sheltered and he was taken care of. Yes. So now we will introduce the people in Hong Kong, the refugees who hit Snowden. And we have pictures of them. Who is this? Now this, this is one of my clients. This is uh, Mr. Ajit <coughs> Pushpa Kamara. And he's a former soldier in the Sri Lankan army. Uh, he's ethnic Sinhalese. It's about uh, a former life in, in Ajit's life. This is 20 years ago. And Ajit is an extraordinary individual. Uh, he was tortured. Um, there was an attempt to extrajudicially kill him. And in the end, he fled Sri Lanka. And I chose Ajit to help Mr. Snowden. Ajit has an extraordinary ability to move around undetected and to move people around. He has an extraordinary skill set. And you don't know when he's there, you don't know when he's not there. Just an extraordinary man. So he was the one individual that I trusted to help us 
move Mr. Snowden around. Yeah, so now you know that while the NSA and everybody else in the world was looking for him, this was the man who protected him. Now, the, the sad part of this story is Ajit has been as an asylum seeker for 12 years now. He, uh, he fled after being tortured in Sri Lanka, tortured by the military. He fled and um, his asylum is still in progress, so to speak. And I think we have another picture. And this is where Ajith lives at this time. It's about 50 square feet. There's no windows. And one thing I'd like to stress is that in Hong Kong, Asylum seekers are not allowed to work. The government does not meet their basic needs. And if they're caught working, they face two years prison. So Mr. Ajith has been in Hong Kong and the Hong Kong government has left him destitute. And the way they've treated this man, as with the other two families, amounts to a violation of Article 7 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, treating him in an inhumane and degrading manner. Nevertheless, Ajith has survived in Hong Kong. And the, one, the, the other aspect, another reason why I, I reached out to my asylum seeker clients is the asylum seekers all fled their home countries running for their lives. And when they met Mr. Snowden, they saw Mr. Snowden as one of their own. When they fled, they had to rely and trust and put their hands into other people's lives who helped them escape their home countries. The asylum seekers have the highest propensity to protect others. And that was the foundation upon which I knew I could trust my clients and when asked, they stepped forward and they said, yes, we recognize him. We want to help him. Yeah, it's, it's an amazing experience. I met uh, Ajit six months ago. And when I asked him, why did you help Edward Snowden? I mean, you had uh, enough problems on your own. And this was a man who was sought after by the most powerful nation and military and, and intelligence service on earth. And the only thing he said was, of course I helped him. He was a refugee. I was a refugee. Of course I helped him. And uh, this is the next uh, set of hosts for Mr. Snowden. Uh, now, was, yeah, please. Th this is the second family. The gentleman here is uh, Supun Kalapata, and that's his partner, Nadika. Uh, Supun is Sri Lankan, Sinhalese, and he fled Sri Lanka based on political persecution. And his partner, Nadika, she fled Sri Lanka based on gender persecution. Um, and very typical in a country like Sri Lanka, gender persecution involves, unfortunately, rape um, and human trafficking, uh, and at times, servitude and slavery. So these two extraordinary, extraordinary individuals fled to Hong Kong Sapun more than 10 years ago, Nadika more than seven years ago. And both of their children were born in Hong Kong. And one thing I would stress is the two children are stateless. They have no nationality. And the Hong Kong government, by law, refuses to give them any status in Hong Kong. Uh, this is uh, the place where they live. And... Um, Right now, the Hong Kong government uh, has not provided the support for the young girl, Setumdi, and she's not receiving an education in Hong Kong. Um, but I'll, I'll move on to another subject later on what we've been doing as lawyers to help these families to make sure they're not destitute at this time. Yes, we have another picture when, when uh, this is where they live. 
you so see. They, so they live in, in literally one of the poorest areas of Hong Kong, and they live in a flat that's about 150 square feet. Um, the other thing I would like to mention is that the screening system for asylum seekers in Hong Kong is so grossly unfair that the acceptance rate since 1992 in Hong Kong for asylum seekers is 0.36%. So effectively, all asylum seekers who seek refuge in Hong Kong are rejected. And the three families I'm representing, they're looking at their cases being rejected simply because the system is just so grossly unfair. Yeah, so that's them. And this is the fourth refugee who sheltered Edward Snowden and uh, incidentally baked him a birthday cake for his 30th birthday and her daughter, which you will see in a moment, sang a happy birthday song to Edward Snowden. This is Vanessa. She's from the Philippines. She was a victim of gender persecution and she fled to Hong Kong. And she's the fourth adult or the third family that provided shelter to Mr. Snowden. Yeah, and that's uh, her this, daughter. This is her daughter, um, Kiana. And the one thing I would mention is that since their identities were revealed to the public, the Hong Kong government has targeted Vanessa and her child and has asked her questions about Mr. Snowden. And when she refused to answer those questions, the government cut off all assistance to her. So she gets no assistance for food or rent or education for her daughter. They cut her off completely simply because she refused to answer questions about Mr. Snowden. Yes, uh, that's you and her. It's me. So in, in, I visited these families in, in summer and uh, shortly before the movie of Oliver Stone came out, we, uh, we published the, the full story in, in my paper at Handelsblatt. And, um, well, good and things, uh, good and bad things happened. There, there was a, a lot of, there was an outpouring of, of helpfulness. I got a lot of calls and emails from around the world of people who wanted to donate to these these families. And um, let me see, there's a the movie. Um, and of course, I wasn't set up for that because journalists uh, don't usually uh, get calls for, for donations. So we set up, uh, let me see if we have that. That, that is also in summer. Uh, this, was in, this was in July this year. I traveled to see Mr. Snowden in Moscow um, yeah. shortly before the, the film. Uh, Snowden came out. But it was at that time I had discussed with Mr. Snowden the situation of the three families because they were portrayed in the Snowden film. And a decision was taken and the clients were advised to, to protect them. It would be better to introduce them to the public before the film came out so that the public would have a very clear idea and clear understanding of who they are what they did for Mr. Snowden, basically to make sure the public understood and they understood them as human beings. Yeah. And Mr. Snowden was in full support of that. And uh, Mr. Snowden's very concerned for my clients and he's, he's also assisted them financially. But what we've done is we've set up a GoFundMe crowdfunding campaign. Yeah, uh, you will have the, the site. That's that's the website to co collect. Uh, even even Snowden. That the thing is, w why did we print this article? Uh, well, first it was a story untold for three years. These people have remained quiet uh, because that's what uh, they all agreed on: Snowden and and the refugees. And um, then the movie comes out, and if you see the Snowden movie of Oliver Stone. Yeah, it's an exciting movie, but the people who actually saved his life have about 60 seconds of screen time. If you see the movie, it's just, 
just a brown mass of helpful people and then they're gone again. So I, I thought it would, it would be really good to tell the full story and Snowden himself actually was surprised when you told him. Um, he had no idea that these people who saved his life were still in the same place where they, where they were three years ago. He was asking, why are they still refugees? And actually, that's a, that's a good question. Uh, the, 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 the answer is the Hong Kong government will not let them leave. They will not let them stay. They will not let them work. They're just staying in this miserable uh, presence. And so this uh, website, GoFundMe, was set up um, because so many people wanted to help. And uh, you can see somewhere on the site, there's, there's like on this website, seven or 800 people have donated. And um, well, that's the good thing that happened. The bad thing was that the Hong Kong government actually cut, when they found out about these the donations, they cut off the service, the, the, the money to the families that they received. And so this is actually almost the only thing they have, donations. And um, well, now there's new hope. There's a, a second website and it's uh, like a, um, this, is a set, this is a fundraiser page. Maybe you want to talk about the, the lawyers who, who are trying to get these people to a, a better place. Right, well, uh, with the GoFundMe page, we've been able to take those financial resources and distribute them to the three families in Hong Kong so that their basic needs are met. And this has provided them with a lot of emotional security and certainty in their lives at this time. Um, three lawyers, I'm from Montreal, Quebec originally, and I've been working with three lawyers that I know. And the three lawyers in Montreal have set up a fundraiser campaign, and they're also making efforts to communicate with the Canadian government um, to advocate, advocate for Canada to take in the three families. These are seven people, and it's not a big stretch for the Canadian government to take them in. Um, the Canadian GoFundMe, the fundraiser site, has recently raised uh, more money. And again, this is the second channel, which is Canadian-based and Canadian-focused where we're trying to raise more funds for the families so we can sustain them in Hong Kong. But we do have a view that the Canadian government should, should take steps to bring them into Canada, not to set a precedent, but on the basis that these seven extraordinary people protected a whistleblower. Some of the difficulties we're facing are that a lot of people don't want to donate for fear that the US government would see that they've made donations to these three families. These three families are innocent. They've done nothing wrong. When they helped Mr. Snowden, they did it in good faith and they never broke any laws. Uh, one thing I want to stress is when Mr. Snowden was in Hong Kong, at no time was he a fugitive under Hong Kong law. The US government never sent through a legally effective request for his arrest and extradition. So these people need, they need support. They need moral support, they need public support, and they need some financial support for help. And I would ask everybody here, and I would ask that everybody here ask, communicate to whoever you know, to have the public become aware of who these people are. And no matter how small the donation, Every euro, every dollar counts. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So, so if if everybody in here not donate uh, immediately, but but uh, I know you all have your phones in your pockets. If you would Twitter and Facebook and 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 all that, that would be really nice. And we're going to try now to connect uh, to Skype with one of the refugees. She's uh, still at home, awake now. It's, uh, it's well past midnight, but we're going to try to, to Skype her in. So you also may ask some questions. Uh, 
Hopefully this will work. Uh, this is, it'll be my client, Vanessa, from the Philippines. So while yeah, here we go. No, that's not her. We don't know who that is. No. Can we try again? Yeah, so while we are waiting, um, this all took a little longer than expected and due to my pro computer problems, we just had a little discussion. I could either do my part of the talk and I would have told you about Snowden's current situation, how to help him, about legal cruelties like the Espionage Act, World War I he's being charged under and so on. Uh, I hope it would have been interesting, but I thought that w with so little time remaining, it would be more important to give the people who helped him and who are refugees in Hong Kong a voice than Amnesty International and me. So I'm going to skip that part so you can have a Q&A with her. And thank you anyway. Sorry about that. Are they, are they trying to get her on? Yeah, they're trying. Well, I think we can have a question in between, maybe if there's a, I don't know how that works. Is there somebody going around with a microphone or? Um, we can, no. should we start with a Q&A? Yeah. Okay, so um, we try again uh, with uh, the calling. The technical difficulties never end. Uh, this should have a name. Is there Murphy or something? Yeah, okay. So I think we can start with a, a Q&A for uh, our three speakers. So please, when you have a question, start to line up at the microphones we have uh, here throughout the room. Four on the left side and three, uh, four on the right side. Uh, on the balcony we have also one. And I start with the single, uh, signal angel, not single angel, sorry. Okay, just hold it, maybe we have a connection. Please, Signal Angel, give me the question then. Okay, thank you. We, we had some discussion in IRC um, about your fundraising platform because um, the, the pricing, um, they, they keep quite a big share of 20%. Why choosing this platform? Could you answer the uh, question? The end of the question was. Yes. Uh, the f fundraiser or GoFundMe? Um, there's, there's really, really not much option for us. Um, the, the one thing I have to stress is uh, the, only, the only groups taking any money from donations are the fundraising, uh, I guess the, the platform or PayPal and the banks. But as for those who are actually administering this, and the three lawyers who formed an NGO in Montreal, and myself in Hong Kong, 100% of the money we receive is distributed to the clients. We don't take one penny for legal fees. We don't take one penny for administrative fees. And actually, ourselves, we pay for the banking fees. So, sorry? Well, that's, that's what we've... One more minute. 
I think what we can see here that, that not everyone involved in human rights work is as tech savvy as everyone here. So if you want to talk to us later about that, I, I guess all that will be very welcome. Um, um, as a previous chemical engineer, I'm a little bit tech savvy. I used to, that's okay. And the second thing is the three lawyers in Montreal have set up a Bitcoin account. So you can donate to fundraiser, go on to the site and there's information on how to donate through Bitcoin. So my apologies for not raising that. Um, what, what we did is Mr. Snowden tweeted um, the fundraiser account on Christmas Eve and it was at that time people were commenting saying, hey, can we do by Bitcoin? So we did that immediately. So I hope that answers the question. So I think we uh, switch over to welcome uh, our new guest now on uh, the stage. Uh, you can uh, look directly at her at the camera. We have her camera set up. Uh, when you look at that direction, you look at her actually. So can, virtually. Can you, can you hear me? Yes. Hi. Good evening. So, Vanessa, you, you see you have a lot of fans in Hamburg. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Maybe if you would just describe, say, your first five minutes when you uh, met Edward Snowden. Uh, how was that? I think everybody would like to, to hear that from you now. Oh. When the uh, first time I met uh, Mr. Snowden, I uh, don't know who is uh, Mr. Snowden. Um, I'm uh, very, uh, he's very upset and um, um, uh, the time he needed help uh, to stay in my home and um, my lawyer, Mr. Thibault and uh, Jonathan Mann knocked on my door. So I didn't think twice to let him, to let him in, in my house and uh, I'm very happy and uh, I help um, Edward Snowden. And um, I'm very thankful to my uh, lawyer, Mr. Robert Thibault, and because he have um, 60 clients, asylum seeker, and uh, he trusted me to let uh, Mr. Snowden stay in my house. And um, I'm very uh, also thankful for Edward Snowden uh, because uh, he, um, he appreciated what I uh, did for him. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yes, uh, uh, now your turn. Who would like to ask a question to Snowden's guardian angel in Hong yeah, Kong? Yeah, we, we have uh, the great op opportunity to take questions from the audience or from the signal angels. So when you have any question, please step up to the microphone. Uh, or do we have something from the signal angel? Hello. Hi. Signal angel didn't want to ask a question. May, uh, maybe then wh when there is not yet a question or not the courage to ask one, may, uh, I c would like to ask you uh, a question. Uh, how is your uh, uh, situation now when you, uh, when you look back on uh, meeting Edward Snowden and uh, uh, what uh, your experience and uh, how do you uh, feel now? How's your situation changed maybe uh, by that to get involved with uh, this uh, thing that hit you uh, out of nowhere oh, situation? Uh, Okay, uh, my uh, situation right now is uh, I have a difficult in the Hong Kong government in about my um, my assistance in Hong Kong, uh, ISS Hong Kong and uh, ISS already stopped my assistance uh, so I don't have any assistance right now I only have from uh, donations 
And uh, in my case, in a torture claim, uh, the Hong Kong government, uh, they uh, opened my case uh, just uh, last month. And uh, now it's activated and uh, I know they want to reject my case. And uh, I'm very worried uh, they want me to send back to Philippines and it's, it's not really good for me. I'm not safety to go back to Philippines. So I am very uh, disappointed and, I'm, and uh, because Hong Kong government is very cruel about my situation, they not uh, understanding about me and my family. So I am, today I'm, I'm very worried. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you. So I think we have a question from microphone number seven. Please go ahead. Hello. Um, I was wondering, when did it dawn on you what you had gotten involved in? And when did you realize um, the gravity of the situation? Like, it, I, I'm imagining that it would be difficult in the beginning. But now with all the aftermath, it's, it's been a very big thing. So, uh, yeah. okay. Like, when, at what point did you realize how big this was? Uh, yes, um, I realized this is a very big uh, point because uh, now the Hong Kong government is, uh, uh, they want, uh, especially to my lawyers, that uh, in one, uh, one, one, uh, one of, uh, one of his, uh, one of, I mean, uh, one of his, uh, he have, one time that immigration want to deal his case for one time for 30 cases in one time. So my case and two other families is including. So I think it's very difficult to my lawyer and especially uh, with me that because I uh, very afraid uh, that they sent me to uh, Philippines. And uh, now I also don't have um, any system from ISS, the Hong Kong government. So it's very hard for me to, uh, to uh, it's very unfair to me that uh, the Hong Kong government is can't rely on my uh, donations. So uh, it's a very, uh, very difficult for me right now. Maybe I can, I can help a little bit with that, uh, Vanessa. The, what what the what the question was, and of course I asked the same thing. The night when she met Edward Snowden, she did not know who Edward Snowden was. It was just a white man in front of her door. So she let him in and and let him sleep in her bed. There's only one bed in the in the apartment. She slept on the floor. And the next morning, Edward Snowden asked her to please bring a newspaper. And uh, well, I think, Vanessa, when you bought the newspaper, maybe, maybe I think that's what the audience wanted to know. That's the minute you found out you bought a newspaper and you see, just, just tell that, uh, that morning you experienced when, when you were looking for the newspaper and what you experienced then. I think, I think I just went there. Okay. Vanessa? Yes. Okay. When was the first time you realized how big the Snowden case was? At what time did oh. you know? Okay. Uh, I just find out uh, when the, the next morning I uh, met uh, Edward Snowden told me by newspaper. This is, newspaper. A, this is in June 2013, correct? Yes, in June 2013. And what, what happened? Uh, in June 2013, um, when uh, Edward Storin stayed at my house, um, he told, uh, the next morning, he told me that uh, he needed the English newspaper. So I bought the English newspaper with him and um, I'm really shocked that the guy who stayed in my home, is the most wanted man in the world. And he, because he's in the, uh, in the front page of the newspaper. So I'm really shocked that uh, the guy is in my house. <laughs> <laughs> so
So, so w what did you do after that? What did you think oh, after that? I think that uh, I need um, I, I need to be careful, and uh, my lawyers told me that uh, don't tell to anyone. The, 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 that's the first rule, and don't let anyone come to my house. So uh, I need to be careful uh, that uh, because I, I don't children stay in my house. So uh, I no let anybody let stay in my house, and I'm not tell to anybody that Edward is still in, in my house. Did you still want to help Mr. Snowden at that time? I, I yes, I'm still want to help Edward Snowden because uh, he no have place to stay, and uh, he needs my help. And uh, I think uh, I, I can uh, do that for him. I think we have another question from the audience, number five at the back there. Go ahead. Uh, hello. Uh, thank you for everything uh, you've done to Edward Snowden. It has been mentioned that uh, you have celebrated his 30th birthday together with your family. And uh, uh, something was mentioned about a birthday cake. What happened there? <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, uh, I received a call and uh, uh, I get the cakes. And um, I don't know that time his uh, birthday. And I asked, so well, why I have a cake? And he said that uh, it was Snowden's birthday. So uh, I bring the cakes at my house and I tell the other student, oh, um, today is your uh, birthday. And he said, uh, yes. So uh, me and my uh, daughter, uh, we sing a song for him. And uh, we uh, we blow the candles, and uh, I told him, "Oh, sorry, uh, today is birthday, but we can take the photos." Yeah. I think. <laughs> we have another question from the signal angle, please. Thank you, um, Vanessa. A question to you. Um, Probably you are afraid for your own family. Um, after all, would you do it again? Yes. Uh, microphone two, here in the front, please. Ask your questions. Um. I'm just going to quickly break the rules that are only questions. And there are um, only questions. Ah, shit. <laughs> I wanted to so, thank you, not only for giving a home to Mr. Snowden, which we all did, but also for being here tonight and giving a face to a lot of stories, I guess, that we don't see usually. Because we did a lot of the first part, and, and this is great because Edward Snowden is, of course, important and did great stuff. Um, but also this other part and for being here tonight is, is great for us and for me, at least. Thanks. I can see your point, but please, questions number four now. Thank you. Um, apart from expressing my utmost respect and gratitude, I have a question uh, to Vanessa and to all the other hosts as well. Do I understand correctly that the government of Hong Kong will not allow you to travel anywhere else but back to your home country? Is there anything that can be done by governments of other countries, individuals of other countries, to take you to another place? Because it does feel like you're being trapped in Hong Kong and there is no good way out either in Hong Kong or in your home countries? Definitely. Um, what's needed is public support and the public being vocal. Um, setting up Facebook, social media groups, um, communicating with your local governments. Um, there's no reason why, for example, the Canadian government, the German government, could not make the political decision seven people seven people out of millions of asylum seekers in the world 
and to offer them asylum. That's all that's needed because they are stuck in limbo in Hong Kong with effectively a zero chance. What I'll stress is the Sri Lankans, if they're returned to Sri Lanka, they will all be arrested at the airport under the Prevention, the, uh, Prevention of Terrorism Act. They'll be arbitrarily detained and it is certain that some of them will be tortured. Ajit the soldier faces a death penalty. For Vanessa, the new president of the Philippines, Duterte, has executed extrajudicially 6,000 people the last couple months. And he's proposed to set up concentration camps to, to exterminate three million drug addicts in the Philippines. These families have been left behind. I'm not gonna let that happen. So it's, so through your being aware of this, through your capabilities to communicate through social networks, your communities, this is really, if we could create a groundswell, this could put pressure on governments to possibly have them step forward to help these families. The, the fundraiser page, it's written in English and French, and it's set out there very clearly what can be done and what's being done in Canada. And um, I have asked my clients where their second choice would be to seek asylum, and all of them have talked about Germany. So whatever can be done to help the fundraiser page, and there's an associated Facebook page with that, um, whatever can be done would be most appreciated. And again, any, any funds that can be given to help the families would obviously um, ensure that they're not left destitute in Hong Kong. Thank you. We are very short uh, on time, but I, I think I have the authority to stretch that a little. I'm, I want to take, I'm sorry, I want to take, he's standing there quite a lot of a long time. So from microphone one, please. Um, yeah, I, I basically wanted to hear from Vanessa because she helped him. What, what kind of help would you appreciate? What kind of help can the world do or we do to you or give you? Um, um, if, if the people want to, uh, help us, uh, uh, I hope and I wish that, uh, you open your heart for the, donate some, uh, money for our fund, uh, racer and, uh, GoFundMe page. It's a really, really big help for us and, uh, we are hoping to send uh, two fam three families to uh, other country to start our new life and uh, have a good future for um, uh, our children. Thank you. I, I am very sorry. I getting signs to uh, cut my uh, that that they want to cut uh, um, uh, do something to me. So. Uh, <laughs> Thanks for uh, uh, your talks and thank you, Vanessa, for, uh, for being here and making it. Uh, it is a, a great uh, um, honor for me. And uh, a big round of applause for Vanessa, Lena Rohrbach, Sünke Iversen and Robert Thibault. Maybe you can show Vanessa with the camera.